Okay, here goes. This man was born in Australia, raised in Australia, lives in Australia. Uh, he played cricket for England. <laughs> Four tests, 35 ODIs. As he rolls his eyes at that intro, he's seen, a, he's heard a thousand times before. <laughs> 14 is captain. And as I look down the barrel, he goes, he seems to be in some kind of car park uh, on the Gold Coast yeah. conducting this interview. Adam Holyoke, such a pleasure to have you on the show this week. Hey, guys. How are you? Very well, thanks. Um, Living in my car these days, English, English, ex English pommy cricketer living in Australia. This is how I get treated. <laughs> oh, it's a nice car, it's leather seats there. You didn't obviously, you didn't, uh, yeah, you yeah. didn't drop down the price. Nice be- bed in the back. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adam, uh, you, you've got a um, such an interesting story in terms of your career and, and where you were raised and then where you played and stuff. I mean, can you, can you start with your relationship to grade cricket? Um, yeah, I've got an interesting one. I guess I left uh, Australia at like around 12 to go over there. So my first real uh, intro into great cricket was when I came back. I think about the age of 18 or 19, around that, I came back. I'd already was playing professional cricket back in England at that stage. And um, so I came back and started playing great cricket in Perth. So, um, yeah, that was my first intro into it. So uh, as, as you can imagine, mate, uh, I know there's one you guys love. I love the dynamic you guys give on the great cricket, but I think the one thing which I haven't seen that you might have put it on there, but is the is the overseas pommy cricketer coming into the great situation? That's one mm. thing I haven't seen one of those analogies yet, mm. but mm. I reckon you should get it in there because I think they're pretty. It's a tough gig being an English uh, pro coming mm. over and playing for a great side. It's not it's pretty. I think it's the highest. I felt more pressure doing that. <laughs> Been playing test cricket. <laughs> well, it's, it's funny you say that because we've talked to a few uh, like English internationals on the show, and the sentiment I tend to, tend to get from it is that like Aussies all think that all grade cricketers think that they could play county cricket. You know, that's mm. the like that the county cricket's about the same level, and the England internationals kind of just roll their eyes and humour them. Like, was that your ex- like you would have played in the nineties though, which was you know the golden era of Australian cricket. Mm. You know, was that your experience as well? Well, yeah, and it was hard to really to disagree with it because we'll get pumped every time we played Australia in, in the international. So they're literally great cricketers, you know, second graders thinking that they could, they, you know, if I was in England, I'd be getting paid 200 grand a year to be, um, to just bowl my little, like, uh, uh, medium paces off five steps. It's, it's all, you're all got bits and pieces cricketers playing for Australia, so for England. So it's, um, yeah, there was definitely a lot of that, um, and it's you just got if you're going to come out and play, you just got to have thick skin and you got to wear it. And I, I don't reckon there's an excuse or a um, there's the reason why there's so many guys who've come out, played great cricket, and then gone back to England and been successful is because, in a way, it kind of toughens you up. Mm. Were there any specific experiences that toughened you up, or was it, was it more on the field or off the field? And if off the field, can you be specific mm. in the showers? Uh, <laughs> um, no, I think it was just, just in general. There's always those old guys around the club who just, you know, when you when you're an overseas player, it's just if you don't get wickets, they just want to tell you how shit you are, <laughs> um, and and they and they're not afraid to express how shit you are and the system that you play in. So I think it's just dealing with that and then going out to play with the other side hating you, um, your own side in a funny kind of way, wanting you to not succeed mm. so they can have a go at you as well. And it's just, if you can overcome all that, it's a really, it's a real tough environment. A lot of people said to me like, oh, you know, great cricket, you know, where does it sit compared to county cricket? I said, mate, great cricket is harder than international cricket. Because <laughs> when, you, when you're playing, when you're playing internationally, as you guys wouldn't know because you haven't been there, but let me tell you about it. That- <laughs> not yet. When you're there. I, I got that. I got that a little bit of Brad Hodge. He's, um, I'm dating. Uh, he, he told me about you guys. He said, just remind them they're just clubby. So you know, I just thought I'd, 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 I'd get it in there early. Um, when, you, when you're playing international cricket, the, the pressure's equally on you from from everywhere. But when you're going and playing great cricket, you're the focus of the attention, your side, the opposition side, and everyone's just wanting to remind you just how bad you are and, I think it's, I honestly think, I'm not sure that's the same for people who grew up in Australia, but for me, it was as tough as international cricket in a, in a, in a different kind of way, of course, skill wise, it goes without saying it's not, but just the pressure that's on, on there 
It's it's I've never experienced anything like it. And guys who play great cricket, they're not mugs. They're good. They can bowl a line and length, and they're prepared to just hang in there and do that mm. in the hope that they get your scalp so they can tell everyone about it. So. Yeah, we could we could play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and you did you feel it was different for you than other English cricketers because you grew up in uh, you grew up in Sydney uh, again you know and Sydney siders of that era will will believe themselves to be part of the golden generation of cricket as well. You, you're actually from around where I was as well in Gladesville. Did you always feel there's always been a bit of Aussie in you anyway? So you you know you've had a little bit of that exceptionalism. Yeah, um, and I always say to people, there's um, I don't think anyone hates anything more and in australia there's nothing more hated than an english cricketer maybe 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 the tax man maybe parking inspectors something like we're in that sort of category but there's one thing that is more hated and that's uh, an english test cricketer who was originally from australia and appears to have been def- defected so um i feel like i got i got it extra um i, I did it was my brother actually who was um who, who did the play for gladesville for cricket down um, there I grew up in Ballarat, right. um, the mighty cricketing town of Ballarat. So uh, it's uh, yeah. So I do have those connections. Uh, it's it's hard to um, to know how to react because actually when we were playing, um, we we're playing. I think the first time they ever had national anthems was at uh, the, the one day international Australia versus England. I think it was the world record crowd at the time, ninety five thousand people at the MCG. And um, we lined up. They decided they're doing the national anthem. So it was that. It was kind of at that moment. I'm standing there, and I like, we'd never done that at cricket before. And they just started doing the English one. And I was like, oh, I don't really know the words to this. <laughs> 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 and then the Aussie one came on, and I was kind of like, shit, I learned this at school. But don't <laughs> sing. Whatever you do, don't sing. Just like, <laughs> just gonna look real bad. So um, yeah, the patriotism's like, yeah, interesting one, mate. Mm-hmm. Interesting one. Okay. Well, let's 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 talk about shit club cricketers and um, England cricket in the nineties. Um, I, I want to know about uh, you, you. You had your test taboo, Nottinghamshire fifth test of the ninety seven Ashes. I want to know if Australia had the fear factor just yet. That was selling to Mark Taylor, but the War Brothers were in there. Warren, obviously McGrath, but did going into that test series? I know you came into the series late. It was a six test series back then, but did Australia have the the fear factor just yet? No, oh, yeah. Yeah, they were um, they were the number one side in the world by a good in Test cricket by a fair distance. Mm. Um, I think they just probably tipped the West Indies off their perch probably for the couple of years leading into that, and they were they were they were ascending. Mm. So um, yeah, they were they were the best side in the world, mm. no doubt. And, and Warney was kind of in his peak. Um, people were very conscious and aware of, of him. Mm. Um, obviously, McGrath was. It was unbelievable as well. So they they were um, they were definitely definitely a very mm. scary side to play against. I mean, the batting, everything, every department. Mm. Oh, you know, I, I know you seem quite mentally disintegrated <laughs> by that, Adam. Just the way you talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about Warney as well, like. Yeah. Uh, like you look back at old footage, I mean, early Warn is my favourite Warn. It's like you know, you like like a band's old stuff better than their new stuff. You know, it was pre-injury, it was wild, the ball spun everywhere, and particularly bowling to Englishmen. I know it was everyone, but there there almost seemed to be a sense of like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, you know, not Man. seen anything like that before. Like, can you take us into your, your shoes there? Yeah, it was. It was literally like that. Um, I no one knew what a flipper was. I was a professional cricketer for Surrey, and then and then they started talking about the flipper. <laughs> And we, no one in England actually knew what a flipper. The only thing I thought flipper was a dolphin, mate. The last thing was like, <laughs> I was like, I didn't know what was going on. Um, obviously, we, you know, you watch TV and you work it out. And, um, but yeah, the aura and mystique around him. There was no one bowls leg spin in in county mm. cricket. Mm. It's like cold fingers, hard ball, tiny outfields. Like this pitch is not conducive to spin. Three day cricket before that, it was like. No one bowls leg spin. Mm. So all of a sudden we've got this guy who not only does he bowl it, he bowls it really well. Yeah. yeah. So and and he's telling you about it as well. So um he was quite happy to talk to you the whole way through it. So he was it was people don't think of like a blonde haired, chubby little guy who bowls some leg spin, you know, as being intimidating. People think of Ambrose and whatever. Mm-hmm. But mate, he was um he was so confident and he's aura on the pitch. Um he definitely had the wood over a lot of the guys in our side. 
Um, you know, when people say, you know, who's the best you ever faced? I would say just for actual like deliveries, just the ball, I'd say Murley was the best. But Warren, if you add the whole mm. persona, the intelligence, his cricket brain, um, his ability to read the game, I think he was the best all round. Yeah. You ever get the circuit with him? <laughs> well, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, he's a really good guy as well. Um, I, I like him. Eh? He's um, he's a different cat to the to the rest. You know, he's he's bigger than life, and he loves he loves the fact that he is. I think so. Um, it's great. You need people like that. Yeah. Uh, I, I love playing against him. Uh, actually, oh, you guys will like this story. Um, so we played the one days, and I. He'd just come off of an, an operation, so he didn't go that well. And me and my brother kind of got the better of him there. I get the feeling after we won the after we got to the position where we won the series. I got the feeling for the rest of the series, he just tried to just not show us too much because he knew we'd be playing in the test series. Um, anyway, we didn't get picked for this test, and we came in for the fifth test. Um, and at this stage. I, I got man of the series in that in that one day series, mm. and we won at three 0 And Australia were coming up some bad form, so I knew when I came out to bat that I'm going to get it. I'm going to like you just it's, you just know it, mate. You, yeah. you know we've got Healy with keeping mm. Taylor at slip, Mark War second slip, Warney at third slip, Steve War in the gully. <laughs> You're going to get it, aren't you? It's like come on, you know, like a couple of nice other people, there. like Michael. Michael Slater's floating around. <laughs> so it's, oh, they're all pretty normal blokes, aren't they? Yeah. Peaceful it, guys. Like, mm. So I came out and I'm thinking, well, it's my first test. I know I'm going to get it. It's just, a, and I'm, you know, I'm obviously, you know, just had that really good performance against them in the one day. So I know they're going to be out for me. I thought they might let me take guard first, but, you know, <laughs> they, 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 they started and they're like, you know, come on then, boys. Let's have this bloke out. Here he is. And, you know, when you're playing in the test match, obviously it's a big moment. You, you're trying to get into the zone. I try and explain this to the people I coach. Just be present. Just be present. So I'm just trying – Glenn McGrath had the ball and I'm just going to concentrate on the scene, block everything out. It's not Glenn McGrath, just you and the ball, you and the scene. Come on then, boys, let's have this bloke out. Here he is playing his first game, playing his first game for England, all his family, back in Australia. <laughs> Wishing he was playing for Australia. Uncle Rex. I was like, shit, you know, they know Uncle Rex. Like, how do they know Uncle Rex? And then they're like, Auntie Jan. I was like, how the hell, how the hell do you guys know Auntie Jan? They've gone away and found out the names of all my, my relatives. So I'm sitting there and I'm going, okay, no, no, back on the zone, back in the zone. Seam, Glenn McGrath, seam ball. And then I'm like, all I can go through in my mind is, I knew Warney's a bit of a woman at the time. I was like, has Warney been there with my auntie, Jan? Because I was on my first ball. That's, That's all I can think about. Like, I mean, I, I, that first ball is just a blur. I'm just trying to solve the puzzle. Has Warney been around and seen my auntie, Jan? <laughs> Fuck it. Um, you also played in one of the more famous test matches in the last probably 20 years uh, or, or more, 25 years, because it was 24 years ago, 1998 at Kingston. The, uh, the, oh, fam- yeah. the famous abandoned game after 10 overs. England were 17 for three. Ambrose and Walsh absolutely peppering the English bats, and especially Alex Stewart. Um, there's, there's, there's great footage of it on YouTube that you can see. Well, great footage because I didn't have to face it. Mm. Um, I mean, you, you you didn't get a chance to bat, unfortunately, Adam, mm. in that game. Although I think you I think John Crawley might have been next, and then you were uh, doing it six, I think it was. But you must right. you must have been pushing Atherton out in the field to be like, mate, call this off because I'm not fucking facing this shit from Ambrose. <laughs> well, I was I was a little bit nuts at those days. I was like, oh, I wanted, I was just punchy and wanted to fight all the time. So um, <laughs> I, I was, I wasn't right. When I look back on it now, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, get this thing called off. <laughs> yeah. But um, it, it was, it was like, and I remember um, Phil Tufnell, um, old Lionheart Phil Tufnell. Mm-hmm. He was um, he was trying to get it called off. He was batting eleven. He was going around the change room, getting towels, seeing what else he could fit down. You know, there wasn't many. You know, the armed guards. I think had only just come in, so he's trying all them on, and it was um, it was pretty scary stuff because oh. the pitch was like I've seen a lot of pitches in my time, and you see, you don't. There's often nothing to suggest that it's going to be that bad. Sometimes they look bad, but they play all right. Never have we 
gone into a game knowing that it was going to be it was going to be a nightmare mm. because um um sorry about that I had a phone call right. um the pitch was was like this mm. and there was a string which they have along the side of the pitch yeah. so that the lawnmower can go along it to keep it straight mm. and that far apart it was the string was touching the ground at that part but in the middle the string was that far in the air meaning that the pitch was just like a corrugated roof mm. if it hit the upslope it basically hit you in the head if it hit oh. the downslope it went along the floor and with ambrose and walsh these guys are bowling <sighs> fast yeah. and it was literally every ball i think someone said there was about i think we played about 10 overs or something like yeah, that it was 10 overs yeah and there was some Something like only 10 balls behaved as they would you'd expect them to. The other the rest of them were just either at your head or mm. straight along the floor. And it was um, it was fast school. We were trying to get it called off. They, mm. Their bowling attack, Ambrose, Walsh, Kenny Benjamin, Nixon McLean, mm. all probably bowling 90 mile an hour. Yeah. Our bowling attack was Angus Fraser, who was <laughs> about 75. Uh, Andy Caddick, he might have touched 80. Myself. Of like 60 <laughs> and then and, and Phil Tufnell. So I'm thinking, I was like, holy shit, like there's like cannons against pea shooters. So yeah, yeah. we were actually lucky that we got that called off because uh, someone could have that was dangerous out there. Mm, it wouldn't yeah. have been too dangerous facing me, but mm. what toughest, but yeah, um, those guys were pretty scary. Well, obviously, if, if it if it uh, if it seems it spins, obviously, so that which I'm sure yeah, you guys would have been you guys would have been fine, but because because yeah. Atherton won the toss and he decides to have a bat thinking that the wicket was only going to get worse. I mean, so. Did you guys have a team talk before that, thinking like, "Hey, if we win the toss, we'll have a we'll have a stick here"? Or were you was was there like when when balls are going over the keeper's head from like half volleys, and you know guys getting peppered? Like, what's the conversation in the dressing room? Is there fear? I mean, you're you're punching walls, by the you're headbutting walls by the sound of things, or mm. tough and all, but mm. <laughs> but um, you know what's 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 the conversation going on uh, leading up into that toss, and then when it's all happening as well? Well. Uh, look, we didn't know it was definitely going to do that. Mm. There was a suspicion it wasn't going to play well. Mm. But um, I don't think – because we'd played a game against uh, Jamaica mm. just the week before. We got 250 and um, and we bowled them one by an innings. Right. Because the same sort of pitch. Um, so we, we thought it was going to be – it wasn't – as bad as this one played, mm. but those the, Jama the Jamaican side didn't have Ambrose and Walsh, so um, <laughs> it was yeah, it was just all of a sudden we're in it, and this is really scary yeah. and it's um and really real. So mm. I think it was it just it was a unique situation. None of us had ever been in it before. Uh, I've never been in a game that's been abandoned before mm. or since. So um, it was a unique situation that I don't think anyone could have prepared for. So. I think it was just so laughable and so dangerous that that actually became a realistic option. Yeah. And I, it was, you know, when Lara, who just likes scoring 400 against England for the fun of it, is trying to get the thing called off, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a dangerous, you know, it's a dangerous pitch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Adam, you would have been very aware of comments from uh, contemporaries of yours about the current England team. And I say that, adding in that you're the batting coach for Queensland as well. So if I could put yeah. this as like cleanly as possible, all of your mates don't think you should bat on off stump and we should do it the way that they did it and everyone did it before it. Can you give any hope to England fans out there that the current crop can bat? And what do you think about batting on off stump or whatever NASA's talking about? <laughs> well, I would suggest that probably the reason why NASA's in the commentary box and not coaching is for that very reason. The game's moved on. Um, I'm not saying you have to bat on off stump, but, you know, they, hey, there's some people around who are doing it pretty well. So it's just like anything. Like, if you bat badly on middle stump or middle and leg, like we did so regularly in the 90s, then people are going to say you're doing it wrong. I think the fact that people are batting on off stump is just a new thing. And when it doesn't work, then it's very easy to say it's wrong. Mm. Um, you know, there's plenty of examples of people who bat on off stump who do it well. Steve Smith does it pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I just think that at the moment they're just not batting well and those guys are paid to, to make comments and it does come across a little bit, um, a little bit like, oh, back in my time. And it's, it's, it's easy to do. It's easy to do. Back in our day, everything was better. Uh, it's, it's generally not. 
you know, the hundred meters, they're faster now than what they were back then. They're jumping high, they're running faster. Mm. And yet cricket's the only thing that's gone backwards. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. Mm. I he's think, got a place he, I think, I, I, Yeah. I, I think that minus, obviously he's another one who gets across the off stump there. And uh, there's, there's a lot of players, more and more players at Queensland are doing it. Uh, they're trying to get their right eye on across onto off stump. So anything outside their right eye, they can let go. Um, but when it goes wrong, then of course you're going to have to face the criticism. Mm. And uh, more broadly, there's a lot of people out there, I think from England and Australia, who are worried about what uh, the current team has just displayed against New Zealand and what it might mean for the Ashes coming up. Uh, w- would you say they should have some hope or some faith or, or are you extremely worried? Um, well, it's, I'm neither really because six months in, in international cricket is such a long time these days and back in the other days it wasn't old days it wasn't but now we saw can't remember when it was not the last Ashes series in England the one before um, England won that series and then came out here six months later I think it was because of the Olympics there was like a really short turnaround and Australia won like resoundingly um, just in the space of six so things changed pretty quickly mm. also the, you know Joffre Archer coming back will be a difference out here I mean, if we look at England in the past coming out here, it's been hard because we haven't had the pace. We come out here on the kookaburra ball. It's not seeming and swinging all over the place. And we have and we generally have been outgunned in the last few years by Mitchell Johnson or Mitchell Stark or just pace and, and bounce. We come out here with our you know, medium quicks who nip it around in England and it's, it doesn't work. But we've got some firepower of our own now. Joffre mm-hmm. Archer, Mark Wood. Mm. These guys are going to make it harder. Um, it's interesting. You've got two sides who are kind of on the, on the rebuild a little bit. So we've got some places up for grabs. So I think it'll be a good series. I don't, I don't think just because they've lost New Zealand uh, with number one, you know, side in the world going, you know, they're about to play for the test championships and their conditions, are, they've got bowlers who can make use to the English conditions very well. So I wouldn't be reading into it. I mean, you've got to read into it, but, it's not disastrous for the Ashes. Mm. I know you wouldn't. You wouldn't have obviously, you know, grown up coaching Marnus, but his his sort of transition over the last like three years, from getting, being a guy who averages thirty in Shield cricket to now averaging sixty whatever in Tests, is unbelievable. And I'm not surprised he bats on off stump because that's what Steve Smith does. So he mm. just does whatever Steve does. Mm. But like, is can you? As a coach, you know, can you see something in Marnus which has changed his drive or his attitude, or he just needed a, a taste to get to the top to then to then excel? Like, because it's we almost sort of take it for granted now that Australia's number three is Marnus and he just averages sixty five, and that's just normal. But like, mm. literally, probably two and a half years ago, it was like this guy's on the outside and he's no chance of doing anything in Test mm. cricket. Yeah, it's about when I joined as the batting coach for Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> Just change his grip or just yeah, yeah, yeah. Bat, no, I just got him to get his elbow elbow up. Get your elbow up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get your just elbow watch up. the ball. Um, yeah, just watch the ball harder. Yeah, exactly. So um, no, he there's there's a number of factors which have which have um come from of him be having that improvement. He's always had that enthusiasm, and I said the best thing you can have as a batsman is obsession. Mm. He that guy's obsessed. Mm. He loves sort of, sometimes he just he just follows you around I'm just wanting to talk about cricket like it actually it's changed well it's changed and you guys will probably appreciate this but i know you you like having your, you know your stories about the tapes on your helmet <laughs> when he first came when i first joined he used to follow me around asking talking just not for advice just you know discussing problem solving for batting mm. and then after a couple of good series now he walks around asking me to walk with him so we can have discussions on it. So there's just the, there's hierarchy the hierarchies. Yeah. Adam walk hierarchy with me. Change, yeah. yeah. What's uh, how would you describe your like? Do you do you have a philosophy on on batting? You know what is it that d- defines you, or what's your point of difference as a, as a batting coach? And you're obviously batting coach of a Queensland side that have just won the Sheffield Shield and mm. uh, some successful batters in that as well. You got Manus and Usman Kawaja as well. You know what what is it that you're you know what's the secret sauce? What are, what are you telling these boys? Um. Well, I'm I'm spending a lot of time with them on the mental side of the game. I think it was Steve Waugh back in the day who said, um, I'm not sure he said it in public some stage, but he said to me, you know, like we we spend 
you know, everyone says 90% of the game's in the mind and 10% physical. Why do we spend 90% on the physical and or 100% on the physical and nothing on the mind? So um, I, I've, I've had a little bit of background in, in fighting um, after I finished cricket and failed at business. I went and did fighting for a bit. Um, and, and then I'm also studying psychology. So I've, I, a lot of the stuff I talk to people about is the mental side of things and then just trying to work out what works for them. You can't just tell everyone to, just if it was as simple as like just bat like Steve Smith, well, then everyone would bat like Steve Smith. It's not like that. You've got to work out what this, you know, there's tall batsmen, the short batsmen, you know, the shorter batsmen usually have shorter levers. They can mm. usually better cross batted shots, taller batters usually up and down the wicket. Um, it's, there's so many aspects and you've got to work out what works for that batsman. Um, I like the fact that you've tried to, get me to give all my coaching tips away in like a, a 40 second question but <laughs> actually it was, it was more like a job interview you know i, I figured yeah. there's a couple of jobs going in england cricket at the moment <laughs> they, they need a coach you know you're just giving me a platform to like advertise oh no, they all listen this is the technique cast uh that people listen to so um no you obviously yeah you don't want you don't want to give away uh too many secrets is it is uh is coaching the national side something you'd be interested in down the track Oh, I'm just so far away from it. Um, which country are we talking about? Oh, that was a, tr- that <laughs> I've got, was a test. I've was... got a passport. I've got an Indonesian passport too. I reckon <laughs> I, I coach them. Um, I, I, uh, I've um, I coached Hong Kong for a bit, yeah. which I know isn't isn't really Australia or England. And I'm so far away from being putting my name in the hat to do that. It's yeah. a bit embarrassing to even suggest that that's a possibility. So. Um, of course, if you know things change and I got mm. more into my coaching, and mm. that would be something that any person would love to do, wouldn't it? You guys would be putting your hand up for the job as well, I reckon. Hundred percent, Adam Holyoke. Thanks so much, mate. Uh, wishing you all the best for your work with Queensland. Uh, hopefully, you can move out of your car uh, soon, <laughs> and um, and there might be some England gigs ahead for you, mate. If you keep doing such good work uh, with the Queensland boys. Thanks, guys. Cheers.